Whoa, hey guys, Tyler here. For millennia, humanity has pondered the true Okay, I, I can't do the voice the whole time, I just can't. For millennia, humanity has pondered the true meaning of life. Innumerable philosophies have been developed to help us cope with our ignorance of what lies beyond death, or even beyond our senses. Similarly, skepticism that what we experience in daily life isn't some kind of illusion stretches back to antiquity. The Chinese philosopher Zhuang Zhou once said, Life could be a dream, life could be a dream. And many cultures have likened life to scenes in a painting. A modern version of this skepticism, the simulation hypothesis, was popularized by philosopher Nick Bostrom in 2003. Presented as a trilemma about the future of humanity, the simulation argument suggests that if we continue to advance technologically, then our immense computing power will allow us to run so-called ancestor simulations, high fidelity recreations of the history of human evolution, or at least parts of it. One consequence is that because they would be easier to create, the number of simulated humans would far exceed the number of real humans, meaning that statistically speaking we are more likely to be in the not real category. This far off idea has attracted loads of criticism from other philosophers and members of the scientific community. That said, its intriguing implications have contributed to the appeal of numerous science fiction films like The Matrix. In this video, I'll examine the primary components of the simulation argument and whether it's really scientifically plausible. But first, a word from today's sponsor, The Matrix Resurrect. Actually, no, that's that's not true. Call me Warner Brothers. Without further ado, let's get started. If we reject the idea that we're living in a simulation, then we are not entitled to believe that our descendants will create tons of virtual worlds featuring their forebears. This is the argument laid out in an essay by Bostrom in Philosophical Quarterly. It's rooted in a sort of anthropic reasoning, that is, reasoning based on the fact that the universe seems to be fine-tuned for our existence. Belieber Believers. Believers in the anthropic principle note that the current age of the universe and uh, its fundamental physical constants seem to give rise to a specific type of life form that can observe it. I should clarify that Bostrom does not directly argue that we for sure live in a simulation, but rather that one of three seemingly unlikely statements is almost certainly true. The fraction of human-level civilizations that reaches a post-human stage, that is, one capable of running high-fidelity ancestor simulations, is very close to zero. Or, the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running simulations of their evolutionary history, or variations thereof, is very close to zero, or the fraction of all people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. Bostrom isn't the only philosopher to propose such a trilemma. Barry Dainton has written about the possibility of neural ancestor simulations as well. These simulated minds could take on any number of forms in the real world, from literal brains and vats to far future humans induced with high fidelity hallucinations neither too far off from the pods in the matrix, to being nothing more than electrical signals racing across the surface of a giant planet-sized computer called a Jupiter brain. To the inhabitants of such a simulated reality, or rather simulated realities, there would be no way to tell the difference between being in an elaborate digital illusion and being in real life. After all, our thoughts are effectively the result of electrical signals racing across neurons within a meaty substrate. Perhaps the meat's not even there. Where's the beef? There are, however, reasons to be skeptical of this line of thinking. One of the biggest assumptions of Bostrom's argument is that we'll ever have the requisite computing power to run high-fidelity ancestor simulations in the first place. The feeble attempts that we've made thus far at running complex simulations in our world have nonetheless been rather energy-intensive, even compared to what would be required. Think about the vast array of servers needed to maintain the most CPU and GPU intensive things on the internet, like 
MMOs, whose complexity absolutely pales in comparison to the actual universe, believe it or not. Or even the computing power needed to simulate things like proteins and chemical reactions. Or the millions of particles that make up simulations of galactic collisions and other astronomical phenomena. Given that things like semiconductors, memory, and electrical wattage will always be finite resources, there are limits to what we can do. Case in point, Computing power, and importantly, the cost of computing power, is tied to a phenomenon called Moore's Law. Moore's Law, first posited in 1965 by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore, is an observation that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit doubles roughly every two years. Moore's Law has been used to guide research and development in the semiconductor industry, acting as a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Advances in digital electronics, including falling RAM prices, improvements in memory capacity and sensor tech, and even the pixel density of digital cameras are all linked to Moore's Law. Here's the thing though, Moore's Law is dying. Ever since 2010, semiconductor advancement has been slowing down and it may be close to an end. What's causing this bottleneck you ask? Well, frankly, we're starting to reach the physical limits of electrical engineering. There's only so many transistors that you can pack into a space that is literal nanometers in size. That said, leading semiconductor manufacturers have been trying to develop new revolutionary IC fabrication processes to keep Moore's Law going, such as three-dimensional and multi-layered circuits. But even taking this and other technologies, such as quantum computing, into account, it's hard to see something like Moore's Law continue indefinitely. But computing power isn't the only concern when it comes to the simulation hypothesis. Some philosophers believe that simulated humans will never have the same kind of conscious experiences that you and I have, or that it would otherwise be self-evident to us that we are organic and not synthetic creations. Some have proposed that if the simulation is in the first generation, then most simulated minds do not exist yet, and our chances of being real go up. Also, physicists, and I, I'm going to butcher these names, Marcelo Gleiser and Frank Wilczek have both pointed out that the universe has so much hidden complexity that it would be totally unnecessary in an ancestor simulation. Gleiser even remarked that running a universe-sized simulation seems like, quote, a colossal waste of time. I like the bluntness. Indeed, the simulation hypothesis innately seems to beg the question, what kinds of physical laws govern the real world? This gets at another problem with the simulation hypothesis. It's not really scientific. To a massive extent, it is merely philosophical and, importantly, unfalsifiable. Numerous scholars believe that the simulation argument is inherently self-defeating via reductio ad absurdum, that it leads to a runaway multiverse hypothesis, which is also unfalsifiable. Falsifiability is a huge factor in determining whether or not something is scientifically valid. If you can't run an experiment to prove that reality isn't real, or something, then uh, <laughs> using science to dismiss what is empirically observable and reasonably inferred is a dead end. That's one counter-argument at least. I should note that there are some who accept the trilemma, but reject the conclusion that we are definitely in a simulation. The possibility that we could go extinct frankly looms over me every day, but even if we don't go extinct, the possibility that we would just lack interest in running ancestor simulations at the scale of the universe should not be discounted. Even Bostrom himself says that either of these could be just as likely, if not more likely, to be true than the idea that we are definitely in a simulation, a sentiment shared among many of his colleagues. They view the simulation argument as not so much a skeptical hypothesis of reality, but rather a metaphysical one with some empirical elements. But again, from a scientific perspective, it's likely that the question of whether or not we're in a simulation is indeed untestable. Or is it? 
What if I told you that there was actually a way to test the simulation hypothesis? A 2012 joint paper by three physicists at the University of Washington, Seattle proposes one method. They argue that a simulation of the universe could be performed by dividing space-time into a set of discrete points. Some of the signatures that we could look for to prove this include anisotropy, or uneven distribution of ultra-high energy cosmic rays, which, uh, according to the physicists, would be consistent with the simulation hypothesis. Such evidence would suggest that space-time is not continuous, but is made up of little bits. Of course, uneven distribution of cosmic rays, which has been observed in limited quantities, could be explained by any number of other natural phenomena, such as weird interactions in the intergalactic medium. What do I think of all of this? Well, as intriguing as the simulation hypothesis is, I, I cannot agree that we are definitely in a simulation. I mean, for one thing, who's to say that the world our programmers, so to speak, live in isn't simulated itself? Why is this where the buck stops? Even if you keep passing the buck so that there's a series of nested simulated realities, the whole thing just eventually becomes so absurd that it falls apart, in my opinion. No matter your religious or philosophical beliefs about what lies beyond, I think it's fair to say that the universe that we live in is not made up of computer code, but is, in fact, made up of real matter. But even if we do live in a simulation, would it really make a difference? You still have to go to school, you still have to go to work, you still have to pay your taxes, you still have family members who depend on you. None of that would change even if we were brains and vats. And as some have pointed out, we may never want to find out if we are brains and vats because the mere act of finding out could end the simulation itself. Even the Wachowskis have stated that given the choice offered in their own film, they would take the blue pill. So go out and keep living your life, because chances are, this is the only one you get. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't listen to a word he says. If you want to know the truth, there's only one way to find out. If you take the blue pill, then everything will go back to the way it was, and you can carry on with your life. But you won't find the answer you're looking for. If you take the red pill, the truth will be revealed, and your life will change forever. Which one, Neo?